The Hobby Lobby decision, new vacancies in the California Supreme Court, the Brian Stowe case, and the trial of Sterling versus Sterling. Brian Kavatak is the former president of the Consumer Attorneys of California. He's with the firm Kavatak, Brown, and Kellner. Thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for having uh, me. Let's talk first about uh, Hobby Lobby. U.S. Supreme Court, uh, a bit of a departure from the Obamacare decision several years ago. What have they wrought when it comes to future litigation based on this decision? Well, if you look back two years ago, you would think based upon the Obamacare decision that this was a done deal. Now we have a 5-4 decision that seems to depart from it. If you're saying two years ago that this is part of a tax, it's part of the tax power of, of Congress to tax, uh, how do you come up with these religious exemptions? I think that's a serious departure. And then if you look at what the court did immediately following Hobby Lobby is they issued six rulings in pending cases cases returning them or affirming them in lower courts that look to be that they're going to allow a wide path for religious type of exemptions. But they said this was a narrow decision. And then they issue six decisions right after that. And I think those six decisions right after that returning the case are very interesting. And watchers of the court look at that and say, what are they doing here and how far are they going to go? What does it say to the U.S. Uh, President, Barack Obama, when they come in with a decision on recess appointments, nine to nothing, even some of his own appointees ruled against him on that? Well, that's, that's all, of his, any, all of his appointees ruled against him on that. That's a bad sign. And it looks like it's going to uh, wear away at the, at the president's power and the president's authority. And when the court does something like that, they're sending a very clear message. You can't do this. The Constitution says appointments have to be approved by Congress. Let's talk about the California Supreme Court. There are two vacancies. They're not yet. Marvin Baxter does retire at the end of his term we, or the end of the year. Uh, Joyce Kennard has already retired. That, voice, that seat's open. Both Duke Majin appointees. Baxter, a conservative. Where does Jerry Brown go with this? So Jerry Brown's going to very soon have three appointees on the Supreme Court. And if you look at the makeup of the Supreme Court. There are other justices up there who are over 70 years old. So how many more justices is he going to get, assuming he's elected to another term? I think he cares very deeply about the Supreme Court. I think you're going to see a Latino appointed. You might see an African-American appointed. I think you're going to see a young person. His last and his only appointee on this court was Lou. But also, remember, there's a little bit of bitterness with Jerry has with respect to what happened to Rose Byrd some 30 years ago. Let's go back. Rose Byrd, he was an appointee. A lot of our audience don't remember that. You and I do. Supreme Court Chief Justice who was uh, who was denied, uh, how do you say, voted out of office uh, along with two other members of the California court that he appointed. She wasn't retained. She had a retention yes. election. She wasn't retained. And what happened as a result of that was three justices were off the court and three justices got to be appointed by Republicans. You had a, a court that has six of seven Republican appointees. Pretty soon it's going to be three. I predict there's going to be a fourth after that. He's going to appoint young people to the court. He's going to appoint people who he's going to see ideologically as meaning leaning to the left. And I predict that three years from now you're going to have a very different Supreme Court. That leaning to the left or leaning down the down the center? Because Jerry Brown's famous for the canoe analogy, a couple of paddles to the left, a couple of paddles to the right. Well, I think that you're going to see what you see with Justice Liu, a very bright, intelligent person, and I think you are going to see some leaning to the left, and I think that's going to be his legacy for the courts. Donald Sterling doesn't want to sell his team. It's been an embarrassment, the whole thing, to the entire city of Los Angeles, to be quite honest, just put it out there. On Monday, tomorrow, they start with a lawsuit. He's suing his wife, who wants to sell the team. Uh, what's at stake here? So what the lawsuit about is not his competency. What's going to happen tomorrow is a determination whether or not he can void the trust after the sale had been already agreed to and entered into. He's desperately trying to say that he can exercise control over this. My prediction is going to happen is that ultimately, if it turns out whether there's a trust or not a trust, you have a husband and wife who disagree. They both own a community property interest in this team. One way or another, I see that team going to get sold. The only question is, is it going to move fast enough? Courts in these kind of matters, in probate matters, in trust matters, do not move quickly enough. And that's exactly what this is. When somebody says, though, wait a second, this is his property. How can you force somebody to sell his business when it's based on a private recording 
And, you know, there is the First Amendment. We don't like what he said, but how does, the, how does the NBA force him to sell it? Well, that's a big question. And what's going to happen with the NBA is they're going to have to look at the situation very seriously and make a determination about whether or not the old saying about those of us that live in glass houses should not throw stones. How far do they want to go with this rule? Obviously, what he said is ridiculous, and everybody agrees it's ridiculous. But how far are you going to move this issue out? The NBA, more than anybody, wants to see this team sold privately quietly they're happy that he makes a profit and they're happy that they don't have to put the hammer down and enforce certain agreements that they have as team owners the jury in the Stoke case said they were deadlocked the judge said go deliberate they're still deliberating what does that tell you so Wednesday they come out hopelessly deadlocked he says go deliberate Thursday they start to ask more questions they're continuing to deliberate that tells me that they are being careful they're being thoughtful about this they want to reach a verdict but this is a tough road to go it's a tough case. It's a very tough case. Uh, people have to realize that trying to prove that the Dodgers are responsible for what these two guys did to Brian Stowe is a tough legal burden. It may be emotional or emotionally something that people feel strongly about, but as a legal burden, it's a tough, tough way to go. The fact that the jury's still deliberating about it has to be very encouraging for the plaintiffs. If they still can't reach a verdict on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, at some point the judge is going to declare a mistrial. If there's a mistrial, that means they're going to try the case all over again? I don't think so. I think there will be a settlement at that point. Brian Kapitak, thank you very much for joining us. It's always a pleasure to have you. My pleasure. Thank you. Up next, the Civil Rights Act turns 50 when we return.